as I saw the season nears across IndyCar and the road to Indy, now would be the best time to take a deep dive. Before the start of 2023, I took a look at a smattering of drivers that had my attention coming into the new season, and for the second year in a row, we're doing it again. Whether drivers that I feel are championship favorites, drivers that may be on the hot seat, or ones that are simply piquing my interest, these are my drivers to look at for in 2024. To start, we touch on a driver that will have a lot of eyes on them this upcoming year. Even more eyes than some IndyCar drivers for that matter, despite being on the bottom rung of the road to Indy ladder. I'm talking of course about Sebastian Weldon. The eldest son of the late great Dan Weldon is now 15, and starting his second year in cars. He's off the back of a championship in the Skip Barber Formula Series in 2023, and will now be in USF Juniors with Velocity Racing Development. Him and his younger brother Oliver are names you should probably get used to hearing about. The two of them are Andretti Development drivers, and while Sebastian is in USF Juniors, his younger brother Oliver is making his debut in cars this year, and even has sponsorship from Hot Wheels. No matter how you slice it, that's pretty awesome. But as for the older Walden kid, he's now getting on the road to Indy Ladder, and I think he's quickly going to start climbing it. Sebastian has some talent, and I think that'll be put on full display this upcoming season. He could very well leave 2024 as a USF Juniors champion. If he did, I wouldn't be too surprised. It isn't the end of the world if he doesn't, however. The kid's 15 and he's still got quite a lot of time to prove his worth. But as far as I'm concerned, Sebastian is really talented, and I think he'll prove soon enough that he's not just a kid with a famous last name. Staying on USF Juniors, I want to touch on driver with another familiar last name, and that is Leandro Juncos, the son of team owner Ricardo Juncos. He's only 18, but he's been in carts for about 12 years. He's found some success in karting, however specifics are a little bit hard to come by. He'll be at D-Force Racing for this upcoming season, and if he makes it up through the ranks we could see him as dad's team in the not too distant future. Those who've tuned into some of my shorts content here on YouTube may recognize this name, G3 Argrius. Ever since my offhand mention of him in a completely unrelated video, I've been interested in learning a little bit more about him and sharing some information with all of you. And after hitting the books, my god do I have an interesting story for all of you. G3 and his whole family are capital L loaded with cash. They are possibly the richest family in all of American motorsports right now. His grandfather, George Argrio Sr., is an interesting fellow in his own regard. He is a former U.S. ambassador to Spain, a position he held under the Bush administration from 2001 to 2004, was a chairman of the Board of Trustees at Chapman University from 1976 to 2001, was the owner of the Seattle Mariners baseball team from 1981 to 1989, owns a massive real estate portfolio spreading across California, and has a net worth of over $2 billion. G3's father, meanwhile, was a powerboat magnate in Newport Beach, California, who unfortunately passed away in 2020. So to say G3 is swimming in cash is a pretty big understatement. G3 hasn't been in racing for too long, as the earliest results I can find of his come from 2019. However, that's not too much of a shock, because he's only 14 years old. However, he has been testing in various Junior Formula race cars for quite some time, long before his deal for this year's USF Junior Series season was ever announced. Speaking of, he'll be driving for J. Howard Driver Development during this season. As much as he may be young, he is very well prepared. Having about one year of testing under his belt before that first race weekend should give him some kind of upper hand. I'll be paying very close attention to how he does this season, because with all the testing he's done, a season with at least one race win should be an expectation is to have a wish. Moving to the second rung of the road to Indy Ladder now, and we have your reigning USF Junior Champion Nicholas Giafoni. The son of IndyCar race winner Philippe Giafoni, Nicholas is a big talent. I knew this as early as last year as I outlined him and my drivers to look out for in 2023 video. My pick turned out to be a good one as he scored 6 wins and won the championship in dominating fashion. I expect this season to be much of the same, as he's my strong championship favorite in this upcoming USF 2000 season. This may be a bit bold to say so early on into his career, but he very well may be the next Brazilian IndyCar prodigy. It's a bold prediction to be sure, but who else could we see flying the Brazilian flag competitively in IndyCar? The only other driver that I could see filling that role is Felipe Drogovic. But instead of taking a seat at Ganassi after winning the F2 title about a year and a half ago, he's decided to stay at Aston Martin waiting for someone to drop dead over there. Felipe has the talent to be an IndyCar star, but he also has a foresight of a blind roly-poly birthed in a vat of nuclear waste. So with Felipe Drogovic giving IndyCar the cold shoulder, it leaves Nicholas as Brazil's IndyCar star in the making. Come back to this video in a few years time. From what I've seen so far, I doubt y'all say that this has aged poorly.
Now on to a driver who will be starting their second full-time season in the USF 2000 Championship, we have Evagoras Papasavas. The Cypriot American has been in the series ever since a Road America ran in 2022, and thus for his time in the series has been a mixed bag. His partial 2022 season was frankly dreadful, as after missing the first half of the season thanks to injury, he only scored a best finish of 12th at Portland. However, his 2023 season was much better, scoring multiple podiums and a win on his way to a 4th place points finish, even beating the reigning USF Juniors champion Matt Clark. If anyone is going to challenge Nicholas Giafoni for the championship, Evagoras looks to be that guy, and arguably needs to. It's time to kick on the afterburner for the 16-year-old if he wants to keep climbing the road to Indy Ladder. We'll just have to wait and see how things go this year. If you ever need an example of how quickly the tables can turn in racing, look at Matt Clark. After 2022, he was riding on cloud 9. Now on the heels of the 2024 season, I have some doubts about the guy. Matt's championship winning performance in the first ever USF Junior season has been talked about before on this channel. And for good reason too, as he was absolutely dominant and really put his name on the map with the season he had. 2023, however, was pretty disappointing. Inconsistency and a plain lack of speed were my main takeaways from that year. But despite that, he is still making the step up to USF Pro 2000 for 2024, and I'm very conflicted on what to expect from him this year. Here's the best way I can put it. A championship would be great, a top 3 points finish should be the goal, a top 5 points finish should be expected, and anything less than that would lead me to ask a lot of questions. I don't think he'll win the championship, that should not be the expectation that people have. However, for his sake, he needs to show a bit more of that 2022 pace. A couple wins and a top 3 points finish is the goal, and I'm gonna hold him to that. Say hello to a quick Aussie on the up and up by the name of Lockie Hughes. Hughes has a pretty good record so far in his racing career. He finished second in Australian Formula 4 in 2019, then took a two-year break from racing thanks to the pandemic. Ever since his return to racing in 2022, Lockie has both won the USF 4 title in 2022 and finished third in USF 2000 in 2023. Lockie has some changes to negotiate this year, as he's made the step up to USF Pro 2000 and has left J. Howard Driver Development for Turn 3 Motorsports. It'll be a challenge for sure. However, his talent is obvious. I'm not really expecting a top 3 points finish from him this year, but a top 5 should definitely be the goal. I'll be keeping an eye on him because he is an up-and-coming talent. If you want to follow a young star in the making, then Nikita Johnson may be your best bet. The young American is just 15 years old, which adds to the fact that he clearly has a lot of talent and creates a very exciting prospect. Nikita finished second in last year's USF 2000 season, beating 21-year-old Lockie Hughes in the process. Nikita also finished third in the inaugural USF Junior season back in 2022 and ran five races in USF Pro 2000 towards the end of last season where he scored two victories and another two podiums. Nikita will be at Velocity Racing Development for this upcoming season, where he is one of the championship favorites. It'll likely be a battle between himself and reigning USF 2000 champion Simon Sykes, which regardless of the outcome should be considered impressive. Nikita is 15 15, and Simon is 23, and the fact Nikita might be the only one to contend with him is quite impressive. Looking at the other side of this likely championship fight, we have reigning USF 2000 champion Simon Sykes. Sykes has been around for a decent amount of time now, as he made his USF 2000 debut all the way back in 2020. However, in his first full-time season in 2023, he was dominant. Six wins along with an additional eight podiums led to him winning the title by 103 points. However, the fact he had three part-time seasons and 26 series starts in the three years beforehand leads me to question how seriously I take that domination. If he dominates his upcoming USF Pro 2000 season, then there's definitely something there. My expectations are somewhat muted for Simon coming into this season. However, I still foresee him being in that championship fight. Keep an eye out for him at Paps Racing this season, because this year will be pretty important for the 23-year-old. Breaking up the discussion of championship contenders now, we move on to Lindsey Brewer who will be racing for Hunkos Hollinger Racing in Indy Next in 2024. In the past on this channel, I went a bit more in-depth into her career thus far and what the season may look like, but here's the Cliff Notes version. Lindsey has been racing for about 9 years, 5 in carts from 2009 to 2014, and 4 thus far in cars from 2019 to today, with the exception of 2020. In that time, Lindsey's biggest success came in the Skip Barber Formula Series in 2021 where she scored her only victory thus far in her racing career. She then raced in USF Pro 2000 in 2022 and 2023, where she only scored two top 10s in championship winning equipment. 
However, she's gotten this opportunity to join Hunko's Hollinger because of two very good reasons. Money and attention. I had a conversation with a gentleman at the Hunko shop back in 2022, and he flat out said to me that the only reason why you'd see a Hunko's car in Indy Next is because they have funding. Simply put, unless there's a pay driver in that car, we're not seeing Hunko's in that series. Lindsay has backing from the energy drink brand C4 and IWC watches, the latter of which used to be a sponsor for Mercedes in Formula One. Along with that, she has 2.7 million Instagram followers, which is actually more than IndyCar's official Instagram account and a vast majority of the IndyCar grid. Let's face it here, without the sponsorship money, added attention from her millions of followers on social media, and her sex appeal, she wouldn't catch a whiff of this series in a windstorm. And before any white knights go into the comments section and call me a sexist that has some sort of anti-woman sentiment just because of my criticism against her, the cold hard truth is that she has shown nothing outside of cleavage and a checkbook which explains why she's gotten this drive. It's good for Hunkos because they'll be getting millions of dollars in sponsorship money, merchandise sales, and free exposure. Lindsay, meanwhile, will be lucky to break into the top 10 in any race this year. I'll be keeping an eye on her. I have morbid curiosity more than anything else. Moving on now to another son of a former driver, albeit a far less exciting one. Jack William Miller is the son of the racing dentist himself, Jack Miller, and is cut from the same cloth as Lindsay. In three full-time seasons in USF Pro 2000, Jack has scored just three podiums and a best points finish of ninth. As for his two full seasons in USF 2000 beforehand, he scored just two podiums and a best points finish of eighth. Driving for his dad's Miller Venetieri Motorsports team throughout his entire career, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see how he got here. You also don't really need to be a NASA engineer to see that this forthcoming season will likely see Jack William as a perennial backmarker. However, the reason why I bring this up is because of a theory I've had for a long time. If Dale Coin Racing is still in existence in a few years' time, a partnership of Coin and Miller would not be shocking in the slightest. It probably won't happen until 2026 or even 2027 for that matter, but that theory is part of the reason why I'm looking at for him even though I doubt he'll score top 5 all season long. Going into some more heavy hitters, we have Salvador de Alba. He's a driver that I doubt will be in championship contention this upcoming season, but he's still one that I have my eyes on. It's not often you see a driver jump from stock cars to formula cars, but Alba bucks this trend. After winning the NASCAR Peak Mexico Series Championship in 2021, he jumped over to USF Pro 2000 in 2022. In his two full-time years in the series, he scored three wins and finished last year third in season points. The fact he put up those numbers in his first two years in open-wheel cars since 2014 is very impressive. He's now going to be in Indy next, driving a collaboration of Cape Motorsports and Andretti Global. My prediction is that Salvador will beat two of his Andretti teammates this upcoming year. A win could be on the cards as well. I won't bet on it, but it could happen. What this year is going to be more than anything else is a proof of concept. If he does well this year, we'll be seeing a lot more of him in the future. Twenty twenty four is going to be the third year of the Force Indy team, and they now have a new driver. After two lackluster years from Ernie Francis Jr., they've now brought in Miles Rowe. Rowe is both younger and actually a proven champion outside of sports cars. For those reasons and many more, people are taking notice of the guy, and I'm one of them. So far in his full-time seasons in USF 2000 and USF Pro 2000, he's finished no worse than second in the championship. This streak of his could very well stay alive. I think a top three points finish is certainly not out of the question. My personal bar for him is to finish top five in the championship. However, less ambitious goal would be for him to run better than Ernie Francis did. Ergo finished better than ninth in the championship and grabbed more than one podium. That's a bar so low that I think a tardigrade could bump its head on it. For Miles, grabbing a win should be the goal, not just grabbing a podium. This also kind of goes without saying, but he's my pick for Rookie of the Year as well. Let's see what kind of tricks Miles has up his sleeve this year. But the driver that I have pinned as my championship favorite for this upcoming Indy next season is without a question or shadow of a doubt, Nolan Siegel. He jumped to my and many others' attention somewhat out of the blue last year, riffing off two wins in a row and leading the championship on multiple occasions. He walked out of 2023 with a third place points finish, rookie of the year honors, and a lot more attention. The only driver that I could see realistically fighting Nolan Siegel for the championship is Lewis Foster, who will definitely be nipping at Nolan's heels all throughout this season. But I just have my doubts about Foster. He's a very quick driver, don't get me wrong, but I also saw a level of inconsistency at Foster that I didn't see from Nolan Siegel last year. Consistency is key. I'm sure y'all have read that in a fortune cookie at some point. And when it comes to deciding the champion in the 2024 Indy next season, I'm going to give the crown to the California kid. It's also going to be pretty interesting to see what he does at Dale Coyne in his select few starts in IndyCar this upcoming season. 
This video has taken so long to make that that part wasn't even in the script because Dale Coin didn't even announce their driver lineups when I wrote that part. Oh boy, anyways, we're already about 3,000 words into this video script and have about 2,000 left to go. So allow me if you would to take a quick little intermission with some good old fashioned shilling. Would you like some more editorial style motorsports videos from me? Then how about you take a look at my newly refurbished second channel. County Line is my new side channel, my new outlet to talk about my opinions about the wide world of motorsports. Whether it be about IndyCar, F1, NASCAR, IMSA, WEC, or even iRacing for that matter, that channel is going to be a place for me to let my hair out a little bit and just talk about the stuff that interests me. It's kind of like a newspaper column, only the chances of getting a paper cut are a lot less high. Videos are already in the works for that channel, and will probably be coming soon. Also, don't worry, the history videos on this channel will still be coming out on a semi-regular basis. And finally, if you'd like to hear me commentate racing, just head on over to Apex Racing TV. I've been commentating up to five days a week over there, so chances are if you click on one of their live streams, you'll be hearing my wonderful voice. Anyways, now let's get on to the IndyCar drivers, because I have a hell of a lot to say. In one of the most shocking moves this past silly season, it was announced last September that 18, now 19-year-old Kiffin Simpson was heading to IndyCar. It was news so shocking that I scrambled to put together a video for later that same day, which considering the hellish process to make that video along with the general subject material on this channel is something that I'll likely never do again. Since then, we've gotten a lot more information as to what this entry is going to look like. However, my thoughts haven't really changed. Kiffin is a decent driver, but this year will still probably be pretty rough. So you may be asking why am I skeptical. Well, the main thing that's hanging me up about Kiffin is maturity. Kiffin is young. He's only about 72 days older than me. At the age of 19, he could be somewhat mature, but when it comes to the world of racing, especially racing in the top flight of American Open Wheel for a team that just won the championship, 19 is very young. It's not unheard of though, as we have seen it in the past from Colton Herta, who joined the sport in 2019 as a 19-year-old. However, the main thing that separates Kiffin and Colton is their past to get here. Colton had been racing in cars for the better part of five years beforehand, finished second in Indy Lights, and even had a one-off IndyCar start for Honkos at Sonoma in 2018. Kiffin, meanwhile, is off the back of a fast but wickedly inconsistent sophomore season in Indy NXT, where he only scored two podiums and finished ninth in the points. He's also only been racing in cars since 2020, and will be jumping straight to full-time IndyCar competition for Ganassi. He is getting thrown into the deep end of the pool, and for that reason, and many others, I think Kiffin's priority should just be to survive. He is in championship caliber equipment, has a fellow rookie as a teammate, and the reigning rookie of the year as another. And that doesn't even mention Scott Dixon or Alex Polo. Kiffin shouldn't be playing water polo once he gets into that pool. Anyone expecting him to do something like that is frankly delusional. What he needs to do more than anything else is just keep his head above the water. Another priority should also be to qualify for the Indy 500, which considering he has no super speedway experience may be a bit tricky. Overall though, I have pretty low expectations for Kiffin. We'll just have to see if he lives to tell the tale of his rookie year. Moving on to the worst kept secret of the 2023 racing season, we get to talk about Meyershank Racing's Tom Bloomquist. The British born driver raised in New Zealand by Swedish parents has had an equally bizarre career path to get here. However, once he got to IMSA a few years ago, it all became clear. He proved in Meyershank sports cars that he is a wheel man, and it was him proving that to Honda that has gone into the IndyCar team this year. Tom has a big learning curve in front of him, and he's doing it with a team who's going through wholesale changes as well. I wouldn't vote on Tom Gang Rookie of the Year this season, however, I I do have some more specific predictions outside of him just building his sea legs. I expect Bloomquist to finish better in points than either Elio Castroneves or Simon Pagano did in the previous two seasons. That is not a very high bar to clear, but something like that would at least show progress and evolution for the team, and would be a good yet realistic goal for the Brit. In terms of the teammate battle, I doubt he'll beat Felix Rosenquist, but I'm not expecting it to be an entirely one-sided fight either. Top 15 in the points should be the goal, and I'm not expecting much more than that. And now we get to take a look at my hands-on Rookie of the Year favorite, Linus Lundqvist. I said in a video I made back in 2022, and I'll say it again here, Linus is a star in the making. After hanging around in IndyCar's waiting room for about a year, he's finally gotten that big break that many, myself included, felt that he deserved. He's now replacing fellow Swede Marcus Ericsson in the number 8 Ganassi car, and I think I'm getting a bit of deja vu. The last driver to replace a Swede at Chip Ganassi was Alex Pillow, and look what he's done in the three years since. Linus is a great talent a wonderful pickup for Chip Ganassi, and will be a threat this season. I expect some podiums from Linus. He has the talent and the equipment to get it done. He could even score a win if he gets dealt a good enough hand throughout this season. But even if those things don't happen, I'll still be looking out for your likely 2024 IndyCar Rookie of the Year. 
Moving from the rookie class of this season to last year's Rookie of the Year, Marcus Armstrong is with Ganassi full-time this year. Some people have forgotten about this, myself included if I'm being honest, but even though the guy seems as bland as bread at times, he's a very speedy driver. In his road course only season last year, he impressed both onlookers and Ganassi himself, as Marcus is now going to be driving the number 11 car full-time. The level of consistency he showed last year is admirable, however now should be the time for some slightly better results. He's yet to get a top 5 so far in his very brief IndyCar career, and that absolutely needs to happen this upcoming season. Podiums could be on the table as well, although if I'm being honest I have more confidence in Lundquist grabbing podiums than Armstrong. That'll be a nice fight between those two. If for this upcoming year you want to follow some make or break seasons, Romain Grosjean has got you covered quite well. His 2023 season went from promising to pitiful in the span of just a few months, ending his time at Andretti with a trail of wreck race cars, unfulfilled potential, and a lawsuit left behind him. He's now at Hunkos, a pairing which is considered by many as his last chance. If this season goes badly, it may very well end up being his final year in IndyCar. His goals for this year are quite clear. He needs to piece together a good full season. It certainly can't be like last year where he goes from challenging for race wins to plummeting to the center of the earth. He needs to be consistent all year long, which is a pretty big ass considering his reputation. Grosjean needs to prove himself as the best driver that Hunkos has ever had in one of their Indy cars, mainly because he's replacing Callum Eilat, who was the best driver Hunkos has ever had. I am going to hold Grosjean to some pretty high expectations. He's 37 and starting his fourth IndyCar season. It's time to get his act together and prove why he should be an IndyCar rather than some younger drivers looking to get in. Speaking of make or break, Felix Rosenquist is now getting into his sixth IndyCar season, and his first for Meyer Shank. His time at McLaren was disappointing to say the least, but now he's back at a team that seems to actually care about him. Meyer Shank would be crazy if they didn't see Felix as a valuable asset to the team. However, just because that's the case doesn't mean Felix should take it easy. If he gets beat by Tom Blomquist, that will be incredibly embarrassing for a five-season veteran of IndyCar. However, I'm not exactly expecting Felix to come out guns blazing either. More muted expectations should be allotted to him just because it is a transitional time for both Felix and the team themselves. This season is going to be a very interesting one for Rosenquist, and could either go really well or really, really bad. It's crazy to think that Renus VK is soon to start his fifth IndyCar season. It's also crazy to think why he re-signed with Ed Carpenter on a multi-year agreement. VK is a fast driver, and is slowly working on the inconsistency which dogged him in the past. But at this point, it's pretty obvious that the team is holding him back. He only scored two top tens last year, and I doubt this season is going to be any better. If things don't improve, which I doubt very highly they will, we could see him try and leave the team. Exactly when Renus VK's contract runs out is unclear, but when it does, he'll no doubt be a massive free agent. Here's one thing I'd be interested in learning about. I'm curious if Renus VK's current contract with Ed Carpenter Racing expires the same year as Will Power's current contract with Penske. I'll leave it at that. Now, before I begin this part of the video, I'd like to formally apologize in advance to Ian Perez. Anyways, the willpower we saw last season was a willpower we've never seen before. His newfound level-headedness we saw in 2022 was gone. Instead, he was back to the pissed-off willpower we've seen before. But unlike in the past where willpower was an angry guy but one of the quickest guys week in and week out, power was all bark, no bite. 2023 was a crappy year all round, and it could signal a turning point for the Aussie. Will is 43, and he's not getting any younger. 2024 absolutely needs to see a rebound for willpower. If not, those faint, very light raindrops of retirement discussions could turn into a Category 5 hurricane in the matter of just six months. Joseph Newgarden's 2023 season confused just about everybody, including the man himself. The Indy 500 win may have finally gotten that monkey off his back, but just about everything else about the year was disappointing. He finished the season 5th in points, which is actually tied for his worst points result at Penske. It's not a bad season broadly speaking, but for Joseph it left a hell of a lot to be desired for. 2024 is going to mark 5 years since his last IndyCar championship, so because of that and the stinker of the year he had in 2023, a comeback to championship contention is probably New Garden's goal, and if that's his goal I'm going to hold him to it. 
on the subject of returning to championship contention, that is no doubt the aim for Pato Award. Pato's 2023 season was a total smoke show. I mean, granted, he was a very entertaining driver to follow last year, but he still had a goose egg in the wins column, and that's what had to have stung the most. 2024 needs to see one thing more than anything else, and that is a return to victory lane. It'll happen, I'm pretty sure of it. But will anything further come out of this season? Well, that's a little hard to say. While a return to championship contention is on the cards, that shouldn't be the only goal. As said before, a win is a must and a couple of wins would be pretty good. Only time will tell what 2024 has in store for the guy. When it comes to championship contention, everyone has their eyes on one man. Alex Pillow is simply no longer an apex predator in the IndyCar world. He is a nuclear bomb. Last season, Pillow became the first driver since Sebastian Bourdais in the champ car days to win a championship with a race to spare. He was both unbelievably dominant and militarily consistent. Pillow's worst finish last season was eighth, which is just absurd. It was the most dominant season of my lifetime by quite a long ways. But now the real question is, can he do it again? Can Pillow become the first driver to go back to back since Dario Franchitti's three-peat in 2009, 2010, and 2011? Well, as far as I'm concerned, yes, he probably will. I think you'd be crazy to bet against the guy. Despite the fact that 2022 saw a substantial championship hangover following his first title in 21, my prediction is that 2024 will be far different. If Polo doesn't go back to back, I'd be incredibly surprised. So when I said this video was going to be long, I meant it. A nine-page, 5,000-word script is a new record for me, I think. So hopefully this made up for the the fact that I haven't made a new full-length video since the end of January. Those are my drivers to look at for in 2024, but I'd love to hear some of yours. Let me know what drivers you're keeping an eye on in the comments section. I'd love to hear what y'all have to say. Thank you all for watching, and have a great afternoon.